Placido de Narvaez is the guy that, that goes to explore this, this area. You remember Ponce de Leon had claimed Florida for the Spanish uh, looking for the Fountain of Youth, uh, which, which he never found. He does explore Sarasota Bay. While he's there, he's the first of the Spanish to hear this story of cities of gold. Now, it seems weird to us to think that the Spanish would have believed that there were cities of gold. But again, the sophistication at this time, they frequently had difficulty telling the difference between works of fiction and the works of history. Because frankly, history was very fictitious at that time period. If they didn't know an answer, they just made something up that sounded somewhat plausible to them. Um, and there had been a work of fiction about a city called El Dorado that had been written. And much like that work of fiction that talked about the fountain of fountains of gold, or I'm sorry, the fountains of youth earlier, the Spanish are going to believe it's a real thing and look for it. Well, now the Indians start talking about this. And that's what he's searching for, these cities of gold. Well, Antia de Narvaez gets abandoned by his own men because he gets dropped off with an expedition of men in an agreement to return at a set time. I don't remember how many days it was, but in a month we'll say, I'll be back here, you need to pick me up. Well, he doesn't make it back on time. And there's no way to communicate with the ships. So the ships assume that Narvaez and his men have been killed by the Indians and they abandon the expedition, leaving these Spaniards abandoned in the wilderness of Florida. Um, these guys being accomplished men then dig out horsehide canoes. They literally build a canoe out of bent reeds, out of sticks that are bent, and they stretch the hides of dead horses over it, leather hides, and create these leather canoes. And they set out across the Gulf of Mexico on these leather canoes trying to find Mexico City. Now, when I said they set off across the Gulf of Mexico, I don't want you to have this image of them leaving Florida and just going straight straight across the, uh, the ocean. They were skirting the coast. They were trying to kind of, kind of skirt around to find this. So imagine what it must be like. They're in Florida, and they're trying to paddle a canoe to Mexico City while skirting the, the coastline. This is going to take a while, OK? It's a long way to go. Uh, their boats finally end up uh, collapsing and being destroyed on what he refers to as the Isle of Mahato. We don't really know what Mahato is. It means the Isle of Misfortune. But most historians believe this was Galveston Island. Okay. Again, this is kind of a, a guess. Okay. It's the only island that seems to match the descriptions uh, that, that, that we're going to get later on from the only two survivors of this expedition. Uh, they end up spending the winter of 1528-1529 with the Karankawa Indians, or as my professor used to call them, the Karankawa Indians. Uh, Karankawa seems to be more correct, so we're going to go with that one. But the, uh, these are not the Indians that you want to spend time with. They were at least rumored by the Spanish to be cannibals. If you don't know what cannibal is, that means the, to, to eat the flesh of their, uh, their, their prisoners and their enemies. Now, I will tell you, I've been to the Karankawa uh, uh, reservations before. Not really a reservation, but the, the, uh, the museum in the area where the Karankawa are, are headquartered. And they deny that they were ever, uh, ever cannibals. But there seems to be a lot of reports of it. So whether they were or not, I don't know. But I do know that I don't want to stay with them over the summer. Okay. Uh, I think it might be a kind of rough, rough winter, 1528-29. The two that survived this expedition were Cabeza de Vaca and Estevanica. That's these two guys. Alvar Nunez de Cabeza de Vaca uh, literally means head of cow. Old cow head, okay? Uh, by the way, he got that name because his father had legendarily been in an argument with somebody uh, over uh, a bull 
and he ended up cutting the bull's head off and leaving it on the front porch of a family as a warning. That he was given the nickname Head of Cow. Um, Cabeza de Baca was a member of this expedition that had gotten lost. And so was Estebanica. Now, when I was in school, we called him Esteban. Okay? That was, a, that was a way to Americanize the name. We used to anglicize or Americanize everything. But he would have called himself Estebanico. And Estebanico was a, he was a Moor. He was an African, a black man. The, uh, now, he would have been Spanish. But remember, the, back then, earlier in this lecture, we talked about how the Muslims crossed from North Africa and they invaded Spain. Well, those were black Muslims. They were North Africans, Moors. <laughs> That's what Estebanico is. These are the only two survivors of the expedition because they managed to convince the Indians that they are medicine men, for lack of a better term, that they are magical and can heal. Uh, part of it is that they understood some things about medicine that the Indians didn't. Uh, they didn't really understand germs, but they did understand how to clean a wound, uh, how to cauterize a wound, some things that the, that the local Indians had not really mastered at this point. And their value means that they were traded as slaves between the local Indian tribes. And they ended up going all over Texas and Mexico, up into what's New Mexico and uh, for a while. And, and maybe into Colorado and Arizona. They're all in these areas. In 1535, these two guys escaped and they managed to reach the Spanish town of Calaca. Um, it's down in what's today Mexico. They've escaped, they managed to get all the way down there. And they come telling stories of cities of gold. They say, we haven't seen them, but all the Indians talk about these golden cities. Well, what do you think that's going to make the Spanish do? Go look for them. That's what I would do, too. Right? There are cities made of gold. I want that gold. So, Fray Marcos de Nisa. Fray, by the way, just means priest, father. It's a, another version of the word friar that we've looked at. Uh, they set off almost immediately looking for these cities of gold. Estevan Ico goes along as a guide. Cabeza de Vaca refuses to go along. He's, he's had enough of it. These guys make it all the way to what's today western New Mexico, where they see the city of Sevilla. It looks like Cibola, or Cabola, whatever. C-I-B-O-L-A. Uh, but it's, it was pronounced Sevilla. Uh, in fact, if you go down to South Texas, where my family's from, they have a, they have a creek spelled that way, and they all call it Sea Willow Creek. Uh, but Sewilla. And uh, they see it, but there's a lot of Indians there. It's off in the distance. It's this golden city. And they, instead of going to it because they had a very small expedition, they returned back to Mexico City to, uh, to say, we know where it is. We have evidence that the le legendary seven cities of gold exist. We have seen them. Now, we know today they did not see cities of gold, right? What did they see? What do you think? Adobe buildings. Adobe buildings, yeah. Adobe buildings, that's exactly what they saw. And if you've never been out to Colorado or New Mexico or Arizona, driven through that, and not seen all of the adobe buildings out there, you're not going to comprehend this. But in the heat of the day, with the sun hitting those buildings, they look gold. They, they really do. They, they, they shine, they glisten, the sand on it kicks off. And I understand where they came from. I also understand where the idea comes from that the Indies were talking about golden cities. Because remember, gold is not just a precious metal. Gold is also a color. So when you say golden cities, you might be talking about a city that's golden color, and I might hear a city made of gold, OK? Whoa, whoa, there we go. We got lots of people coming in now.
Can y'all turn your microphones off? I'm not sure who's coming in. Suddenly we have about six different people on our side. So. Haley, your microphone is on. Thank you. <laughs> All right. The next one is going to be the Coronado Expedition. Uh, the Coronado Expedition is led by Francisco Vasquez de Coronado. This is a picture of it uh, from, from a great Texas history book that was written by uh, uh, Robert Weddle years ago. Uh, Bob Weddle was kind of the dean of Texas history when it came to uh, particularly French history, but also colonial history. Uh, in 1541, Coronado leads an expedition out into Zuni country, uh, basically New Mexico and Arizona. <coughs> and he's looking for this village. Well, he finds the place that they had seen, and he discovers that this golden city is in fact nothing but an adobe village. It's not truly a, a, a city made of gold. And he's furious. Well, wouldn't you be? Instead of just uh, accepting defeat, he believes that there is still a city of gold. And he begins capturing the natives and torturing them, demanding that they tell him where the city of gold is. But since there isn't one, they're all saying, we don't know. We don't know. So at least according to legend, he burns some of these natives at the stake. Literally burns them as a threat. And one guy steps up, an Indian that the Spanish called the Turk. I don't know what his real name was. They called him the Turk. I'm certain that wasn't his real name. Uh, but the Turk comes to the rescue and says, I'll lead you there. I know where it is. It's a place called Quivira. And it's just, just down the road a little bit. And the Spanish take him. He leads them away from his village. Uh, when he gets there, they discover that Quivira is also a city of mud. And the Turk is executed. But he gave his own life to try and protect what was left of his, of his village. Uh, kind of a heroic thing to do. Coronado is going to return back to uh, Mexico City and report to the crown, to the governor, that there is no gold, and the area that's going to be known as Texas and New Mexico and Arizona, that area, is going to be ignored by Spain for the next 50 years. By the way, this was the largest cattle drive in history. Uh, the Spanish didn't know what kind of food would be out there, so they brought with them cattle and, and, and pigs and stuff to eat. And there are some historians, this is argued a lot, okay? So don't take it as, as absolute fact. Some historians believe it, others think it's, it's just a myth. But there's a lot of historians that believe that the cows and the pigs that escaped from the Coronado expedition provided the seeds that became the Texas cattle industry and eventually Texas's pig industry. Uh, if you read about Coronado's expedition, he came right through East Texas, uh, came through the Piney Woods. And he talks about coming through here that the grass was so tall that he had to stand up in, his, in the stirrups of his saddle in order to see it over it. Now, if you've ever driven cattle, imagine driving cattle through grass that's taller than the cows. You think you might lose some? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense to me. And especially lose some pigs, right? Um, so it kind of makes sense. And we know that 50 years later, when the Spanish decide to come back and, and recolonize Texas, they find a thriving uh, wild cattle cro crop there. But where they come from? It kind of makes sense to me that it came out of the Coronado expedition. Uh, because they weren't native to, they weren't native to Texas. Hernan de Soto, I don't know why all these guys seem like they're named after old, uh, old Detroit cars. Soto, LaSalle, Pontiac, all of those things ended up being uh, explored. <coughs> in 1542, DeSoto sets off to explore the Mississippi River Valley. 
Um, he's all over Florida and Alabama. Uh, DeSoto died pretty mysteriously. So sometimes you'll hear this called the DeSoto Moscoso expedition because a guy named Luis de Moscoso will take over from this point forward. Um, he's probably going to be a more effective leader than DeSoto ever was. Since DeSoto came first, he's still got to be more famous, but Moscoso was probably a better, a better leader. I'll give you a second to write that down before I move on. I know I'm going through a lot of these real fast. Uh, we spend a lot of time on the real important ones. The others we just kind of uh, glance through in a survey class. You know, you could spend a whole semester just doing the Spanish period. Uh, I did in grad school, so it kills me to go this fast through some of this stuff, but we, we have to. We have to cover a lot. I just about got it. So how far is this expedition going to reach? Um, it's going to make it all the way into East Texas, to the Trinity River, in what's today Houston County. Um, you don't know where Houston County is. That's uh, uh, well, it's kind of north of Houston, south of Dallas, right down 45. Uh, Madisonville, Crockett, that kind of area is Houston County. Um, so what are they going to do? Well, they march back down, back, back over to the Mississippi River, where they build bull, bo bull boats. Yeah, those are just canoes with cowhide stretched over it. And they start sailing along the Gulf Coast, where they made it to, we believe, to around Beaumont, Texas. Beaumont, Port Arthur, and that area. From there, they don't have any boats, and they have, they march across land, so they're marching all the way to Paducah, Mexico. Think about how far these guys are walking. They're paddling a canoe from the mouth of the Mississippi River to Beaumont. That's like from New Orleans to Beaumont. It's a pretty good track. And then walking down to Paducah, Mexico. And they started in Florida. Kind of rough. <laughs> Always wanted to try and build one of those full boats just to see if I can do it. But I'm lazy and I haven't done it. Y'all just about done? You looked it up? Yeah. All right, I'm going to move on. So what is Spain's colonial plan going to be? Uh, what they're going to do is they're going to take the lessons they learned during the Ray Conquista in Spain, and they're going to apply them here in the New World. Remember, the Ray Conquista was when Spain was trying to reconquer the, the peninsula from the Moors, the Muslims. And they shifted to a, a culture of uh, ranching rather than farming, because in times of war, you can move your, your, uh, your livestock, but you can't move your crops if the enemy shows up. Well, they brought that culture here, 
And that's why the American Southwest has this ranching culture that it does. Um, first thing they would do when they would show up in the New World is they would build a presidio, this armed frontier fortress. We saw pictures of what those look like, this large walled area. By the way, that comes from the Latin word presidium, which was the name of the, uh, the guards that guarded the emperor. Um, later on, it became the name of the, uh, of all the guards. Presidium became Praetorian, Praetorian guard. Uh, but it's Presidia with Spanish. They would then establish a mission, a frontier church, uh, where they would establish a presence, a permanent presence, uh, and try and befriend the Indians, which I always find it funny. The first thing we do is we build a, a, build a, a military fortress to kill the Indians, and then we build a church to make friends with them. Uh, maybe we should have tried that the other way. And they start converting the Indians. Remember, God, gold, and glory. One of their major things is to convert the Indians. And if the Indians will adopt Christianity and move in and become what we call praying Indians, suddenly we can negotiate with them. And the Spanish start negotiating and trying to uh, get more territories. And finally, once that presidio is there and the mission is there, only then do they establish settlements. And the ranchos start showing up, the ranch ranches. Uh, you've got to tame the land with your military and your god before you bring in your settlers. Okay? Worked very well for the Spanish. Everywhere except here. From Texas north, it didn't work so well. Worked great Texas south. Or New Mexico south, rather. Y'all all got it? All right. If I go too fast, y'all tell me. You don't have to write this one down. Uh, it won't ever be on a test, but I'm going to talk to you about it. So these Spanish settlements act as urban outposts. Uh, they always organize them the same way. In fact, if you go to a lot of uh, old Spanish towns today, you'll see they're organized this way. San Antonio is organized this way. Uh, Nacogdoches originally was organized this way, although it's been changed quite a bit. The only place you can really see it is the, uh, the very downtown area. Uh, they're organized with all their roads running at right angles with a center town plaza. Always have it this way. The east side of the plaza was where the church buildings were, while the west side was for government buildings. There was a reason for this. It's so when the sun rises, you're providing sunlight for early church services, and then as the sun carries over, it gets darker later on the other side, so you can work later in the, in the evening. Um, so morning light assists mass, while afternoon light allows government workers to work into the night. The citizens try and follow these rules whenever possible. This is because you could go to any Spanish settlement and know your way around. The grid system was there. Uh, you knew right where everything was. <coughs> Excuse me. It provided a continuity and a comfort anywhere in the world. The Spanish loved that. So these ranchos, these ranches, for lack of a better term, uh, the rancheros, and you don't want to have this one on the test either, the rancheros didn't just tame the land. They were also providing food for the, uh, the soldiers, the presidios. They were providing food for the settlements. They were acting as emissaries of the crown. Uh, the fact that the Spanish came as settlers is going to be important. We're going to see with the French, they don't come as settlers. They come as conquerors. Only the English... Only the English and the Spanish came as settlers. All right. Third section, black. This is an important one. And I'm going to apologize to you now because there's not nearly as much information on in black as there is the rest. I know that's going to hurt your feelings if I have to write it all. Uh, but the reason why is because there's just history is written by the winners, and in 1492, Africa did not win. Um, so they didn't have they didn't have a written record. 
What we're going to look at is what African society was like about 1492 and what West African culture was. And the reason we're looking at West African culture is because of this map. This is a map called the African Diaspora. Diaspora is a word that means forced removal. Uh, so this is the forced removal of Africans. And you can see the vast majority of African slaves came from West Africa. Uh, very, very few came from East Africa. And that culture is what's going to come and settle in, in, in America. Those who did come from East Africa mostly went to the uh, Middle East anyway. This map is always shocking for some students because you can look at it and you can see that the, the bigger the line is, the more slaves went to a place. So we always think about all the slaves that came to the southern part of the United States. Look at those arrows. They're actually very small amounts. Where did most of the slaves go? The vast majority went to South America. And if you think about what people look like in South America today, it makes sense to you. Okay? They are, the people in South America tend to look either Indian or black. Why? Well, that's who settles there. As you come further and further north, people get paler. They, their skin gets wider uh, because there's more European in it. And you can see why just by this, by this map. Okay? It makes sense if you think about it. So what is West African culture going to be like? West Africans tended to live in small villages, not in large cities, although that will change from time to time. There were some fairly significant cities. <coughs> that picture up there at the top, right, is of Timbuktu. Uh, that's a mosque in the, the, the capital city of Timbuktu. Um, it's made out of sand, it's uh, an Islamic mosque, very, very advanced. But that's going to be the exception to the rule. The vast majority of cities are small villages. People tended to live in extended families. That means that you lived with your mom, your dad, your aunts, your uncles, your grandparents. Uh, everybody lived together. In most cases, the senior man was, uh, was the dominant person, so whoever the oldest male was. Um, Religion was incredibly complex in this area because of where it was. Think about where Africa is on the map. It's got native African animistic religion, uh, such as nature religion. It's also right next to where Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all got started. All of these religions are going to spread into this one area. Uh, so that's going to be pretty significant with this. Their religion is going to be complex and it's going to mix all of these ideas. <coughs> that's going to make it pretty easy for these slaves that arrive in America to adopt Christianity because it wasn't a strange idea. Though. They were they had already been exposed to it. They had division of labor, that meant they had specialization, they had jobs, and they had slavery. They had slavery in Africa. The white man did not introduce slavery, but what the Europeans, the white man did introduce was race-based slavery. Slavery in Africa was not based on your race and it wasn't generational. What that means is you weren't a slave because you were black or white or purple. You were a slave because you lost the war and you were captured. Okay? And it's not generational, so your your child would not be a slave. Okay? It's just you. It's not something that, that, that goes forever. When the Europeans start buying slaves and they buy them from other Africans and shipping them uh, around the world, they're going to make it generational where you're a slave and your children are slaves in perpetuity. That's different. Okay? <coughs> Why is West Africa going to be the perfect place uh, to, to get your slaves? Well, think about it. Uh, this is our, uh, our snapshot slide. Remember I told you you're going to have a question your test to compare red, white, and black in 1492? This is the black one, the, the black slide. It's going to help you. 
But West Africa has three different climate zones. It has desert, it has savanna, and it has rainforest. Why is that going to be important? Well, because when they come to America, you're going to be able to buy slaves that already know how to grow crops in your climate zone. And that's what they're going to do. If you're in Georgia, that's a savanna climate zone, you're going to want slaves from a savanna climate zone that already know how to grow these crops. The slaves were the experts at. Uh, and, and that's going to be, be very, very effective. Uh, hard for us to imagine, but, you know, cotton and tobacco are the two things that, that, that cause Africa the most pain of all. They taught the Europeans how to grow most of those. They were the experts on it. And slavery grew out of that. African society was also not a primitive society. It had pretty advanced ideas. They were trading through the Middle East and in Europe and into Asia for hundreds of years. They traded goods, they traded ideas like religion, slavery. Uh, they traded religions all the time. The problem was that Africa was not centralized. There wasn't a central government that could unite and fight against the encroaching Europeans. The Africans were busy fighting against each other and they were often too willing to uh, side with the Europeans against their other African enemies. So you would have one African tribe go to war against another one and then capture them and sell them, sell them off as slaves to the Europeans. Uh, it's really a sad fact that Africa, which should be the richest continent in the world, it's got most of the uh, gold, almost all the diamonds in the world, one of the largest oil fields in the world, and yet it's one of the poorest because of this time period, because it was raped of its, uh, of its resources. Okay, wait back up. There you go. When Portugal first arrived in Africa, they did not see the Africans as inferior. In fact, they thought they were equal. They, they looked at African uh, uh, kings as equal to their kings. They saw it as a new trade outlet at first. Uh, But once slavery becomes important, once sugar, that was the first big slave crop, uh, becomes something that you can sell to the English, and man, the English love their sugar. They still do. It increases the power of these forest societies because they're able to provide the slaves for the sugar plantation. Okay? Give you just a minute to finish writing this down before we move on. Y'all all got it? If I go too fast, somebody tell me, please. And we're almost done. What is going to be the impact on African Americans? Um, you know, we didn't actually turn to Africans first as our slaves in America. We tried enslaving the Indians. Columbus tried that. The Arawak Indians, they all died. Why did they all die? Well, they didn't have any uh, immunity to, to European diseases. It was wiping them out. Uh, <coughs> and he worked them to death. The Africans who had been, <coughs> excuse me, evolving right alongside the Europeans for thousands of years and had been uh, exposed to the same diseases had the immunities. So they end up proving to be the perfect uh, slave, particularly for sugar and rice plantations, because they carried, they frequently carried a community of malaria. While, uh, called John Moon fever back then. But, uh, while, while the, the Indian did. So we end up turning to African labor, and it's going to drain West Africa of the best and brightest. The people, the, the the Africans that were the smartest and healthiest 
were all sold off into slavery. As a result, you were leaving behind a, a, a group of people that were not going to be successful for a long time. They are still feeling that. They are still feeling the the, the, the of that. Uh, it takes a it takes about three generations for wealth to accumulate, and Africa has is really in their first generation of freedom. Sometimes the second, but that, that, that's really it. Africa has not been in a free place for a, for a very long time. Um, plus, if you look at it, between 1500 and 1800, the African diaspora stole at least 12 million Africans. At least. Now guys, that's the smallest number I can find. I've seen that number as high as 45 million. Okay. We don't really know how many. We can just look at, at, at population pyramids and go, Africa really should have a population of this, and it doesn't. So what happened? And we kind of estimate back uh, through generations, because there's not a good record of it. But somewhere around 12, at least 12 million people were stolen. That's a lot of wealth to steal, OK? And you might not think of people as wealth, but how much wealth is made if you don't, don't have 12 million people, you know? That's a whole lot. All right. That gets us through this lecture. Um, if I haven't got this one posted up yet, I will post it up today. The, uh, I will get the first half of a study guide up for you. Your test will be over this and colonialism, so we've got a couple more lectures to do uh, with colonialism as well. If you've not gone on and filled out your form saying what your research topic is, you need to do so immediately, immediately, okay? Uh, I think there's three of you left that haven't done it, so please get it done. Um, other than that, I think we are done for the day, and I will see you next time.